And just for your own amusement about technology, I'm holding in my hand a uh, Dell power supply. And the reason I'm holding it is because just a few minutes ago, it gave off a loud snap noise and a curl of smoke came up from it. So it has been unplugged. It is being consigned to history and I will replace it soon. I'm using my friend's borrowed computer right now. So uh, I hope this is all working. And I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome you. Let me welcome everyone to this week's Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, I'm the forum's creator, and I'm your cat herder for the next hour of conversation. And I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a couple of wonderful guests on a great topic, and I'm really looking forward to it. Our topic has to do with digitization and book scanning and the role of libraries, companies, and nonprofits in trying to build new platforms for a kind of universal library. And the form of this topic comes in a great new book called Along Came Google, which is a history of focusing on Google's book digitization project. And along the way, we get to learn a lot about other digitization projects, some of which might be famous, some of which you might not know. Along with that, you get to find out the role of higher education and what roles university libraries as well as university leaderships played in shaping them. And we get to learn about where this is headed next. Since courts managed to more or less block Google book scanning project, where will this go? Will we have a future digital library of Alexandria? Now, to join us in this conversation and to share their thoughts are the two authors of this book. And I'd like to bring them up one after the other. One of them is Deanna Markham, who is at Ithaca SNR. She's a senior advisor there. And the other is Roger Schoenfeld, who is a program director for Library Scholarly Communication and Museums, also at Ithaca. Fair warning, not only are these two people, both my friends, but they're also wonderful, wonderful folks. So I'm gonna start off by grabbing Roger and hauling up on stage. And Roger, by the way, is also part of my hair club for men. You'll, you'll see what I mean in just a second. Roger, welcome. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Brian. Oh, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Are you uh, are you in the office right now? Yeah, I came into the office today, and this is me having a haircut just a few days ago. I was going to complain about that. <laughs> you've, you've dwindled. Uh, you've shrunk. Um, it's it's good to see you. You too. Uh, Roger, just uh, I introduce you in all kinds of ways, as you know, and sometimes enjoy. But the way we do things here in the forum is to ask you to introduce yourself by describing what you're going to be working on for the next year. What are the big projects and issues that are going to be top of mind for you? So at Ithaca SNR, we are going to be working on a couple of things that we're, we're really, really excited about. Um, one is, um, is a series of projects for underserved learning communities, which includes higher education for incarcerated individuals um, and, um, and student basic needs as well. So we're doing a lot of work that falls into that category that we're incredibly excited about. and It's going to have just a huge impact. Um, and then on, um, on a totally different direction, doing some really interesting work on research integrity and the way that misinformation and disinformation is affecting uh, all of us, um, as as you know, Brian, a topic of shared interest for for both of us, I I, I believe, and and for many people here. But by yep. the way, Roger is a uh, frequent contributor blogger at the Awesome Scholarly Kitchen uh, blog, and I recommend checking out every one of his posts because he also very very thoughtful considerations on that. Those are two very different but still related and powerful courses of action. I'm I'm glad to hear it. Um, now that I've got you on stage, Roger, let me add your colleague, your co-conspirator, Deanna Markham. Hang on one second. Let me see if I can get her up on the screen. And hello, Deanna. Hello, Brian and Roger. Hello. It's so good to see you. Are, are you all, no, you're not in New York right now, are you? No, I'm, I'm in Maryland. Very good. That's where I live. Very good. So yeah. now we have the East Coast more or less covered here between uh, DC, Maryland, and New York. Yes. Deanna, what? I mean, you have such a fantastic and illustrious career, and I keep bragging about you to people. <laughs> what are you What are you going to be working on for the next few months? What's What's top of mind? Are you going to be uh, following along with either of these projects that Roger just described, or are you oh, going to be pursuing? I'll follow along. Um, I'm not so involved anymore. I'm pretty much retired, but um, 
my upcoming project is to um, work with the Council on Independent Colleges on their open educational resources. Oh, excellent. Project. Excellent. Oh, I'd love to hear how that goes. That's great. Um, the CIC does great work. It has what? How many colleges? Like a thousand in their membership? I, hundreds, anyway. <laughs> it's, it's huge. It's huge. It's a, it's a wonderful group. Well, yeah. this is great. Uh, friends, if, if, you're, if you're new to the forum, uh, welcome. Uh, what I'd like to do is just ask our authors uh, a couple of quick questions to get the ball rolling. But then the ball is in your court. We'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions. And you could put them to uh, Roger and Deanna or both. Uh, Phil, thank you very much for the quick answer. Uh, Phil, that's from the CIC. Uh, so just, just to begin with, um, reading your book is, is a terrific cut through so much of history. Uh, it, 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 for me, it just it, everything from the Library of Alexandria to Brewster Kale, the questions of copyright to questions of book scanning. Um, I guess one question I wanted to ask is, is the Google project doomed? I mean, did the courts just put a stake through its heart? Is Google Books stuck right now? It seems to be, yeah. Wow, wow. Do you have another opinion, Roger? No, I think, I think the reality is that the transformative opportunity that many of us were looking forward to from being able to really unlock access to this wealth of you know, cultural and historical information just um the the it, it it didn't it didn't come to pass in the way that many of us had hoped and that said it's had some incredibly powerful benefits along the way um and i'm sure we can talk about those also but uh, but but ultimately the the most transformational vision um it it failed yeah um that's in so many ways heartbreaking um, it is heartbreaking <laughs> not all in part because there's no there's no real uh, replacement there's no there's no uh, competitor at scale um, but I no one else has the resources I mean the individual libraries don't and they had tried to do some small digitization projects and right. they hadn't started with some of them but um, but you know nothing like google and so it's the book is a very sad sad story in many ways well the, the, some of the history it covers is 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 pretty sad um yes well, it, what, um, so i mean this is this is where i mean there's a lot of copyright policy that that we can talk about that which might kill some people in the audience just from the, the, the generator but but the, the, the key thing was that a, a copyright suit uh, stopped it in its tracks. Um, let, let me ask the, the academic question, and this, this builds on what you've both said. Um, what does this mean for higher education institutionally? I mean, in, in your book, you show how my great alma mater, the University of Michigan, contributed mightily to, to this project, that quite a few other universities uh, play different roles, including Stanford by graduating, uh, a couple of the computer scientists who went on to make Google. Um, but what, uh, what is this, how does this connect with higher education now? Well, well oh, go ahead, go ahead, Roger. Well, one of the one of the ways that it connects is not so much substantively. We can certainly talk about the substantive um, need for these collections and the value that they have. But I think there's also a connection in terms of the way that universities can collaborate with one another for larger public goods to advance larger public goods and some of the limitations of those collaborations, some of the needs for outside catalysts sometimes to get them kicked off. And uh, uh, I think there's some very, very interesting elements in in, in all of that. Uh, Deanna, I'm sorry, you, you were gonna say something else though. No, I, um, it's interesting to see how often library collaboration has failed in the past. Mm. And I, I finally concluded that's because libraries just don't have the money to participate at scale the way that for a project like the Google project. Um, but I also give such 
high praise to the University of Michigan for what it's done and the leadership that the provost played and um, how important he was in making all of this happen. And um, we need more people like that taking leadership roles and insisting on help from colleagues and so Sorry. this was a, a powerful lesson learned that uh, we yes, have some limitations of, of where higher education can collaborate yes. um, and, and what it requires and the importance of, of visionary leadership. Yes. I agree. Uh, I have one more question, friends, and then and the floor is yours. Um, what about some of the other projects that are out there now? I mean, for example, Brewster Kale's Internet Archive has been digitizing all kinds of stuff and making it available. Uh, we've got um, the Public Library, uh, Digital Public Library of America, which uh, I'm not quite sure what it's doing right now after Dan Cohn, but it's doing something. Um, and we have uh, all kinds of libraries who are digitized different things. And then we have Amazon, which went off and created this enormous uh, ebook uh, world ecosystem of its own. And then we've got pirates like uh, you know uh, Sci-Hub, uh, who have their. I mean, so. Where do where do we stand? We don't have a single library of Alexandria. We've got a whole bunch of branch libraries that are all independent. Well, it, my my opinion, Brian, is that um, libraries are not really well positioned to collaborate with each other, and so. Um, I think we'll have a lot of individual projects. A lot of libraries have digitized parts of their collections and made them available. Um, but there is no single place that's bringing all of this together to create a national digital library, which I think we all hope for. And and of course, you know, Brian, in the in the um, way that you just sort of articulated all the different contributors. Um, it's, it's not just that there isn't a single digital library, Dan is exactly right about that, but you can also see um, you know, an array of both um, commercial and corporate um, interests that play an increasing role in mediating access to mm. all of this information, right? So the one of the consequences of having um, all those branch libraries, right, as you, as you put it, is that we rely on services like Google to help us figure out which libraries to use. Mm -hmm. And and I think that I, I think there are some issues there around how that switching network actually works and in whose interests it's it's operated that you know that are, are part of the consequences of of some of these um, you know of, of of the of the reality you've 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 um, you've pointed to. The um, yeah no, that's a good point. Uh, that that new layer, that new intermediary layer, is, is vital. I, I want to circle back to that, uh, but I do want to open the floor, uh, friends, to any questions uh, for our guests. If you'd like to ask about the details of the story of the rise and fall of Google Books, if you'd like to ask about some of the other projects that are out there, like whatever happened to Microsoft pouring a lot of money in that direction, if you'd like to ask about the specific roles of libraries and also academia in general. Uh, this is the great place to ask. Uh, so again, just either click the raise tab. In fact, let me make it even easier than that. Uh, on the screen, you should see a kind of teal colored uh, podium. If you just press that, you will suddenly appear on stage. It's even easier than being beamed on board in Star Trek. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a quick question from Kay Hampshire. I just want to read this out loud. Uh, can you expand on what makes it difficult for libraries to collaborate? Well, uh, again, my opinion um, individual libraries have their own goals. They're trying to make certain things happen and they focus first on those. And then if they have um, specific projects that require collaboration, um, they can join forces with other libraries and um, the biggest problem for libraries is budget. And um, 
I think that's why we don't see so many big projects undertaken mm -hmm. by a collaboration of libraries because it's just too hard to pull that money out of other things and make it available for a collaboration. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that there are those resources. I'm sorry, I got some getting some feedback now. Is can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. we're getting uh, we're getting an echo. Is it your earbuds there? Uh, who knows? Okay, so <laughs> no, it's good now. Better. Okay. Um, there are those resource issues that Deanna was pointing to, without any question at all. But I think we've also seen some cases where it's challenging for the um, for libraries to determine when they sh when they are what the alignment with their parent institutions is, and how that mediates in different directions that they may want to pursue. And so I think, especially for academic libraries, you have cases where um, one institutional strategy pulls in one direction, another institutional strategy pulls in another direction. And so there can actually, there's also, I think, some structural um, impediments that, you know, one of the things that was so interesting about the Google project was that, uh, to Deanna's point, there were so many efforts to digitize collections before before this particular project started. And the fact that there was an outside catalyst that kind of had a bit of a startup mindset and said, we're just going to move forward, we're moving forward with this with whoever's willing to do it with us, was a very different, it was the resources to be sure, but it was also a different kind of mindset that was less about, can we get consensus across a community about something and more can we just find a few willing contributors to move to move forward, and I think that was a is a different kind of collaboration than we've we've sometimes yeah. looked at to, in the past. Yeah, indeed, and I think we were all a bit surprised when the announcement about the first five mm. libraries uh, were involved with Google. Um, it it caught us off guard. We hadn't been having those conversations with one another. Well, that was a, that was an, uh, for me, uh, actually a point of moment that, uh, that there was a lack of transparency that some of those yes. were done in the dark. Um, yes. And uh, I think these are, these are really, really great points. Um, thank you, uh, Kay, for the really direct and elegant question. Um, we have uh, more questions coming in before I get a chance to ask any more. And this is actually a comment from the splendid Phil Katz. And Phil says, I would be interested in hearing more about the split between digitization of materials and discovery tools. Sometimes these seem to have operated more in tandem than other times. So I don't know if I'm going to be speaking exactly to, um, to, to, to your comment here, Phil, but I mean, we're certainly, you know, there's been an array of different digitization and, and born digital collections that have been created over the course of time, whether it be through Google, Microsoft, et cetera, uh, these digitization partnerships, the Digital Library Federation, individual institutions that have pursued digitization, institutional repository issues, um, our colleagues at JSTOR, um, a, a whole wide array of efforts to, to create digital um, collections. And of course, the primary publishers, not, not least. Um, and, and discovery has, in the way that I conceptualize it anyway, has tended to come from a set of platforms and tools that have tried to um, provide a starting point that cuts across as many of those content sources as possible. So you could look at, you know, Google, Google Scholar as a, as a sort of discovery service. Um, you could certainly look at some of the discovery services that libraries have long provided, whether it be through their catalogs or their abstracting and indexing services, or these new um, sort of broader discovery services that that they um, that they sometimes provide. So, so I sort of I tend to see them as as separate categories. But of course, every one of those collections also has a search engine attached to it. So you're you're right, and and the distinction is always a little little bit gray, and for that reason, and and, and probably for others as well. Diana, do you want to jump in? I was just going to say, welcome to American capitalism. <laughs> um, that explains a lot of it. Uh, and 
one of the things I realized in writing the book is the number of times small groups of people got together to do something, but there wasn't an effort to engage the entire community and try to get more momentum behind some of these projects. So we have a lot of individual projects that are very valuable, but supported by relatively few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, one of the, another poignant series of moments in your book is, is people kind of have great ideas and then not getting, you know, not getting uptake. Uh, Phil, thank you for that, uh, for that really good probe. Um, and thank you both for the very good answers. Again, if you're new to the forum, these are the ways that uh, uh, the Q&A box can really work. Uh, we have a question from Lee Nichols at uh, Western Carolina. And Lee asks, is there an advantage to multiple overlapping digitization projects? Redundancy is good sometimes, but there may be others. Well, I, I, let me just tell you again my opinion. Um, redundancy is fine and it is sometimes very important but I think for major projects that involve libraries getting resources out to the public um, that requires more thought more discipline and I, I don't I'm not so sure that redundancy is what's needed, but but mobilization of resources to get things out to people. That's a good question. Uh, I would think of redundancy and tools like lots of keep, lots of copies keep stuff safe. <laughs> yeah. And we, we have a, a question from uh, our longtime friend uh, Charles Finley at Northeastern, uh, who asks. How does a you, how does a library maintain ongoing access to digital archives over time? Who can maintain access with different operating systems and types of storage? So there's a there's a growing um, preservation infrastructure that has come into being in recent years. So, um, for example, with respect to the collections that have been digitized through the Google project we, we cover in the book. There's a, an, an organization um, called Hati Trust that um, has been preserving and, and making accessible those, those materials. Many um, libraries have chosen to become members of Hati Trust and support it. It's a, you know, it's a community supported initiative. For e-journals, there's um, initiatives like the one you mentioned, Brian, the, the Clocks Initiative, as well as the, um, the Portico Initiative. Um, there's, you know, the Internet Archive has a role to play. So there's some of these kind of um, community supported uh, uh, services. Um, my colleague, our colleague Oya Rieger is, um, is finishing up a, um, a project looking at a set of services that university libraries, but also potentially archives or museums may use to digitally preserve their own digitized or born digital collections locally. Uh, so there's a whole category of tools and systems like those. Some of them are community supported, open source in some cases. Some of them are commercially provided. So there's an array of, of tools like that as as well. well that's, I'm getting a sense of an emerging landscape uh, from the conversation here. Um, you know, out of, uh, out of one, many. Uh, if <laughs> yeah. The, um, and by the way, Roger mentioned Hadi Trust. Uh, you should on your screen on the bottom left have a kind of gold colored button that will let you uh, click to that if you like. Um, and can you, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by Hadi Trust, by the way. It, can, can you, let's see a little bit about its origin? Because it, it kind of spun out of the Google book scanning project in an interesting way. Um, so I'll, I'll start, Deanna will want to add, will, will want to add to it. Um, so there was, it's, it's actually a really interesting story because the, uh, the folks at the university, then at the University of Michigan, who were most involved in the early digitization work, soon realized that there would be benefits if the libraries could control a digital copy themselves and not just rely on Google to be the steward of the digitized version. 
this this sounds like an obvious move in retrospect, but at the time it was not so obvious, at least I don't think it was so obvious, that the libraries would get a copy of the digitized scans immediately. And um, and so anyway, so having got having begun to realize that that the volume of um, you know the meg megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes of material that they would be getting um, would go beyond their current you know, storage abilities. They they soon began thinking about well, what would a storage solution look like? What would a preservation solution look like? Mm. Um, they initially approached. Um, the Mellon Foundation, which is what, uh, at least at the time, anyone in this space did. It was the first thing you did was you went when you went to Mellon. Uh, you called Don Waters. You went to Mellon, uh, and you um, and and for a variety of reasons, Mellon didn't end up supporting Hadi Trust. And it's a really interesting story. We 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 provide some details in in the book, and um, and and as a result, there was no catalyst where someone could say, "I have a Mellon grant to do this." which is how a lot of collaborations at the time yep. got started. I have an IMLS grant, I have a Mellon grant to do this. And so everyone is sort of accrete onto that vision. So there was actually a need for that kind of leadership that Deanna was, was describing. And Deanna, maybe you should kind of take it from, from there. Well, I, I think this too comes from the provost at Michigan who, who had a vision of how it might all work. And he articulated that vision um, extremely well, I think. And consequently, he was able to get other people to join in in um, developing Hadi Trust. Um, I think their, their biggest early decision was what should we call it? <laughs> and yes. and um, they searched long and hard to come up with Hadi Trust, I'm sure, but uh, the elephant is, is a great um, memory symbol. Um, I, I think leadership is, again, the answer. Mm. Um, mm. And someone who had a vision and someone who was willing to keep working on it and seeing it through and talking to lots of people and including lots of people. I, I think he, he has, um, he has certainly earned my respect. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a great effort. Uh, just over the past year, I, 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 literally can't think of how many different ebooks I've been reading off body of trust yes. uh, from Russian literature to science. Um, uh, it's a, it's a great project. So here's a plug, um, you know, in the future trends forum, we always try and give you something nice and exciting to take away. And, and there's, there's, one. there's one. We have, uh, we have more questions that have come in. Uh, one from, uh, Katie Herzog, another librarian, and she asks a classic question. Could you speak to access versus ownership in terms of digital content? and the concept of library collection development. And I think she put that in quotes in order to draw attention to how collection development is problematic now. Kate, please let me know if I'm mangling your question beyond recognition. <laughs> and what, what is this difference between access and ownership now? Well, I think we've all learned in the digital world that what we own is extremely limited mm. we have mm. ways of getting access to things um but i i don't know i i think the um, libraries are simply not the institutions they once were and they were building individual collections for faculty and students. Um, now, it's more likely that they, they work with others to figure out how more access can be provided. And I, th I just think that's the way things will go. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly, that's exactly right. And I think Hadi Trust is actually an interesting illustration for, our, for, for the purposes of this question, because 
um, the easiest option for the libraries and the option that they take in almost every other case um, is, yeah. as Deanna says, is to say, we'll just rely on access. Um, and uh, I, can, I can tell stories, it'll, it'll probably go too far in the weeds right now, but I can tell stories about, mis I I'll say mistakes that I think libraries are making due to financial expediency today where they're foregoing ownership-like models um, in exchange just for access in a way that will come back to bite them in three or five years from now. But but Hadi Trust is is an, an an interesting exception because as as Deanna was saying before, the the libraries uh, the the leaders that um, the Michigan Provost and others at the time um, who saw the the need for the libraries to control a digital copy. Of the files, it's it's a really interesting thing because what does ownership, what does ownership really mean in a digital environment where everyone can have their own copy of anything? But but so for for the purposes of the digital, what what I think is interesting about the Hadi Trust example is it shows that it's not so much that the libraries needed to own it and that Google shouldn't therefore own it also. Uh, you know, everyone can have a digital copy. The benefit to the to the community of the fact that the libraries, that the, that the, that the university community retained a, a copy was that they could push the boundaries on access in the ways that they felt met their values and their risk tolerance. So, you know, the um, examples are, for example, for, um, for print disabled users, um, Hadi Trust was, at, uh, you know, in a very early stage of its development said, we're going to take, uh, you know, much more um, accessibility focused perspective than than Google would ever you know think to take and and more recently during the pandemic you know had really opened up access to these collections to uh, staff and faculty members and students from um, from from their member libraries in a way that in a way that was only possible because they actually had control of the digital files and I, I think that's an interesting I, I wish I wish there was an opportunity for libraries to 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 reflect on on what that means and and not that not that the University of Michigan itself or Berkeley or Harvard or whoever needs to have a copy of their own but somehow that the fact that the community has that stewardship role and the opportunity to push the boundaries with it re really made it has made a, a big difference I would I would argue yes I think so Thank you. Well, this is fascinating because this is a great point and there's a almost an oscillation happening between owning something and not owning something and uh and uh lisa hinchliff just asked a, a related question uh about uh, the difference between how trust as a collection rather than as a platform and and she said that you were just speaking to that in, in a sense roger and I, i'm i'm wondering if if both of you could just just press on this a little bit further what would happen if we thought of Hadi Trust more as a platform, less of a collection? Where where else might that take us? Does that lead to a kind of every library having a, a shadow archive of its own, or do we get more and more loading of content on the Hadi Trust? But where might that head us? You know, I think it's I I think it's a really interesting question. I I I don't see Hadi Trust principally as a as a collection um so so i i don't know if i maybe i said something inadvertently or or maybe others have conceptualized it that way but um i i absolutely agree that it's a it's a it's a platform it's a service it's a i i'm reluctant to say a business but it's an organization um and and where that takes us is an interesting question i think um i think we've already seen some of the approaches that they've taken with access. We've seen some of the approaches they've taken um, with um, uh, uh, with research, th thinking about um, text and data mining, for example. Um, so so yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to hear others' ideas, or, or Deanna, you, you may have thoughts there. I just, I, I'm well, the, the thinking one interesting question. thing that bothers me about Hadi Trust, and, and it's only one thing because I think they do great work, um, but it's still a membership organization. You pay a fee to join Hadi Trust. And, you know, ultimately, if we're moving toward a digital national library, you know, the, 
what's in the hot and dross is, is a huge part of that. And yet, um, right now, it's open to members. Mm -hmm. And that that worries me. Like a subscription library. Yeah, it, yeah. One of, for me, one of the fascinating parts of the narrative you unfold in this book is that you had uh, the, you had that mission, uh, you know, the Boston Public Library open to all, right, or free to all, um, but also you had the role of so many oligarchs, uh, yes. you know, Paul Allen doing this, you know, the heads of Google doing this, and then you had major mega companies doing things. And you have these in, uh, unusual nonprofits in between uh, organizations, like how they trust, but like Internet Archive. Um, it was a, it was a nice kind of snapshot of our time of how things have, have transitioned. Uh, friends, we have uh, uh, we're coming with the last twenty minutes, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask their questions. Um, you already see how you can do that with a Q and A box, and people seem to be completely not shy at all in the chat box. Um, <laughs> We have a, a puckish question, well, that's how I characterize it, from Charles Findlay um, in the chat box. Uh, he asks, won't NFTs influence the whole publishing industry for all media? So NFTs are non-fungible tokens. You see why we call them NFTs. Uh, and they are basically single instances of digital content that are backed up by the blockchain. Uh, so he wants you to think of NFTs in this context. Roger, Deanna, you wanna give that a try? I have nothing whatsoever to add to this. <laughs> I really I, don't know, Charles. I'm sorry. I'm sure we're a disappointment. Well, we've 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 had several sessions uh, about uh, blockchain technology in the past, and uh, we really should do one on NFTs. If yeah. uh, if it doesn't lend us to get banned in different countries or, or blackballed in different ways. Um, Speaking of wonderful friends of the program, we have uh, Roxanne Riskin, who asks a different question. And let me share this one. Are you seeing libraries act more assertively in digitizing microform, microfiche, and physical assets for preservation access, meaning addressing accessibility issues that these media have by design? Well, I, I think you're right, Roxanne. Um, there's, the pandemic has, so upset general ways of working and people are not working in libraries they're working from home and they're not digitizing as far as i know i haven't heard of any library taking on <clears throat> digitization of microfiche or microfilm um, and we have a lot of it in big libraries we have huge amounts of microfilm and microfiche that will need to be digitized. And yet, um, I don't, you know, I, I don't see a lot of hope right now. And I'd like to. Um, I, I just think the other problems that libraries face are too overwhelming and they're working on those and not on some of the obvious things that we'd like them to work on. <laughs> is, there, is there a role for governments in this? I, 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 I don't want to inject politics in this. I'm just wondering, you know, thinking on the public side, um, you know, for the Department of Education, for example, or uh, an, an, an especially ambitious state government like California or Washington. Um, have, have any governments had a, a, a powerful leadership role in this? Some of the, oh, I was only going to say some of the European governments yeah. um, took a real interest in, um, in, in digitization generally um, following the Google announcement, the Google digitization mm -hmm. announcement, not least out of a concern that this was um, basically going to favor, you know, English language materials that the French, uh, the French first, first and foremost, um, were deeply concerned about what this meant for the future of the French language. It was a very interesting um, uh, kind of kind of moment of both anxiety and influence in, in some really interesting ways. I, I don't know that there's much going on at this at the state level in the US. I do think that accessibility issues um, just to come back to, I believe it was Roxanne's question. I do think that accessibility issues um, have been one of the 
substantial drivers of librarians of libraries in um, in their in, in the digitization process. Not not the only one, but certainly an important one. And I, I think that's that's just worth um, you know worth worth pressing on because um, as important as those issues are. Um, you know, there's a broader strategic context in which in which all of this works that I think Deanna rightfully has been has been really emphasizing. Well, it's a great question, and, and thank you, um, uh, thank you, Roxanne, as always, for a great question. Thank you both for a really really good answer. This does bring us towards a question that was asked some time ago, and I didn't want to lose sight of it. This is from Sharon Alker, uh, who asked, uh, "What are the most important concepts we have learned from the successes?" Of the Google Books project, and Sharon, as she just bought your book, so thank you, Sharon. On behalf of Christine, thank you. Christine yeah. Press, I say thank you. <laughs> what, are, what are the successes that we can learn from? Well, we've learned that um, if a company, if in this case Google, sets its mind to do something, it can do it, and. Um, we had so many small digitization projects going on in libraries when Google made its announcement, but they didn't have enough resources to make it a big project. And I think in these times, we have to think bigger. Bigger than Google. <laughs> I, Please go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I was just going to. I think that's. I think that's right. Thinking, thinking bigger, and thinking with more agility and and speed. Yeah. I think. I think is is um, are, are are also words that I would add. Um, I I think that there are a few other. I don't know if these are successes exactly. I mean, I think one success is leadership. We've talked about that a number of times, and so you know, just to put that um, in this context. I I th I do think that the other um, you know the other success here is to really think about um, some of the ways that you know it, it's not just what what couldn't be done or, or I I don't see this just as some of the ways that the library community. Um, could have done things better, or you know, we wish they were different than 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 they are, or that they had some some more potential. But I, I also see this as um, as a success in on one basic level of a commercial partnership, mm. and um, mm. for for all of the ways in which we wish more had come out of it, um, the libraries got got all the collections, all the materials that are in Hadi Trust. I mean, the most basic level, the libraries got all the materials that are in Hadi Trust. Um, and the ability to use those for for free, for free. right? I mean that that's a that's a pretty pretty great success. And and at the same time, for those of us who care, to my introduction at the beginning, for those of us who care about having validated high quality information available online, there were millions of public domain books that are now populating Google search results that. Yeah never would have been there otherwise. So I think I think the fact of the matter is that um, is that there 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 are some really great outcomes of this and those outcomes were possible precisely because of a of a commercial partnership that you know ad admittedly a lot of us um, you know have some have some um, implicit reservations uh, about. And you have a, there's a great footnote early in the book where you where you describe the nascent field of Google studies. And, and I shouldn't say nascent because you go back 10 plus years and the printed <laughs> scholarly books in the subject were like, you know, Siva Vaiha and Nathan, for example, or Shoshana Zubal's work. Um, but yeah, that, that's a really, really good point. Uh, a successful, productive uh, uh, result. And we still have the results. The snippets are still there. Yeah, it's still there. And the other result that I think is important is that we saw what technology could do and in a way that we hadn't seen before. And that's that has been important and it's helped a lot of libraries move ahead. Well, there are breakthroughs in terms of you know scanning everything from the, the hardware uh, on up. There's yeah. a there's a fun science fiction novel from around 2005 uh, called Rainbow's End 
<laughs> it was a parody of a Google book scanning project. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah, a giant company goes through what's what's uh, I think it's UCSD, and they go through its library, and they have a uh, a tool that will guillotine the books, and then slice the pages up, and float them in air, and then scan them as they drift uh, with lasers. And I thought I was like the only person laughing delightfully when I read that passage. Um, but we have uh, more questions coming in. Um, and I, uh, this is one that comes from uh, Carolyn Coward, who has one of the great jobs, by the way. She's a librarian at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Oh, wow. so just everything is good about that sentence. Uh, and she asked about controlled digital lending, which is which is a different thing. I mean, the the giant public library was supposed to be one which would be uncontrolled digital lending if it were. Right. Um, but what, what about controlled digital lending? Where does that stand now? And Carolyn, if you want to add more to that, please feel free. Well, it's something that we've been we've been paying a lot of attention to. Um, frankly, even since we you know finished the finished the the book, um, you know, I think I think we're seeing for for those for those who don't know, it's possibly a term that's not not familiar to everyone. Controlled digital lending is basically where um, a library will essentially buy or own a print book and sequester that print book and, and and while that print book is sequestered can make available a digitized version even if they haven't you know bought or licensed the digitized version just just digitized it themselves so that's controlled digital lending as as i understand it um powers has powered the um the hottie trust um uh, emergency temporary access program um there's a version of controlled digital lending that the internet archive has been Mm -hmm. uh, has been using for some time. And I think there are really interesting questions actually about whether controlled digital lending is a, um, you know, is a reason for libraries to keep their print books and not just, not just deaccession them all in favor of, uh, in favor of the digital. There's a really interesting piece in the scholarly kitchen a few weeks ago by a group of, um, individuals from the Boston library consortium who are, um, you, you know, thinking about how to build infrastructure at a consortial level so that if i understand correctly so that potentially um, one library can sequester a book and another library can lend it and so i think there's a lot of really exciting things going on right now now all of this is again as i understand it untested by the courts and i'm not exactly certain um how how you know how that may turn out so that's going to be very interesting to uh to see i believe the litigation against the internet archive is is probably going to help answer answer yeah. that question yeah and, sure. and brewster to his credit was doing this a long time ago yeah yeah well, he, that's right he's a, he's a major i mean leadership and this is one of the major yes things. hello carolyn greetings to the west coast can you hear oh. me yes, yes. excellent yes. no i did i had a follow-on question and this, i don't know if this is answerable or not um controlled digital lending is also a response to current copyright law um, we're trying to play by the rules. We're trying to be good soldiers and good stewards. And it is governed, as you say, copy by copy by copy. It really depends on the owning library, what kind of rights they're extending to their user population. And it can get really murky really fast. And so my question is, what changes to current copyright law need to occur to kind of catch up with where we are in the 21st century. I mean, I'm not talking about egalitarian. I'm just talking about to make it functional so that we can serve our user population. Yeah. Well, I, I know that the Library of Congress has put together a group to revamp copyright law. And <clears throat> I think it's extremely important. Um, all of the laws that we're now living under were written before digital technology. <laughs> and that makes it very hard to try to interpret. I mean, yeah. just, you're constantly trying to say, now let's see, what, what will really work and what won't work and uh, what are we able to do? And I know that's, that's really hard on libraries. That's, we're, we're going to avoid diving deeply into the, the minute details of the 1976 copyright law, <laughs> um, which, uh, I mean, it, there's, there's a lot to it. And, and I think your book, by the way, does a very elegant job of giving us just enough to understand 
where fair use comes from and how that was claimed and how that was ruled against. Um, Carolyn, this is a, a, a major, major issue. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, we have time uh, for uh, one uh, one more question, and this this is and, and I want to ask one last one myself. Uh, this is an optimistic question uh, from uh, Roger, um, excuse me, Robert, uh, who asks: um, In the beginning, many were critical, they were skeptical about whether the idealism around the project from the leadership would survive the next generation of leaders and shareholders. Weren't they proven right? Did the idealism of this not survive, or um, do we still have some flames of idealism flickering away? What do you think, Deanna? <laughs> I was going to ask you to. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I have to admit I'm not um, as involved in individual libraries as I used to be, so I don't know what the tone is like when they're having these discussions. But I will say from results, um, we haven't seen so many. And that that always worries me. I And I don't know who the leaders are right now who are taking stances and, and making speeches and you know, talking to other librarians about it, I just I don't know. And and I think and I I, I you know it's it's so interesting. I think that um, some of the places where that I don't know if I, I don't I'm I'm I think I'm having trouble with the term idealism. I, I guess I'd be more comfortable with a word like uh, or with a phrase like transformative potential, something <laughs> something like that, strategic transformation. I. I think what we haven't seen is the degree of strategic transformation that the leaders working on this 10 and 15 years ago um, gave us reason to hope we would have seen yes. by now. And, um, and I think that where we still see a flicker of that, it's, for example, in the Big Ten Academic Alliance, mm -hmm. the, uh, where they, they say, and I'm not sure what we're going to see happen tangibly, but they say they're going to create a single big collection mm -hmm. shared across those dozen or mm. like, 15 yeah. institutions. Will that come to pass? What will that actually look like? Will it result in transformation and access, a dramatic reduction in cost, a, an opportunity to you know innovate in scholarship? That's what we're all looking to see. Yeah. And we haven't seen that yet. And part of it is because people just can't meet right now. And that has taken a real toll on progress. Well, that's that really has slowed our ability to, to work together um, and, and too much. I, I, I think we have a, a question that came in from Twitter from P.F. Anderson, who's at the University of Michigan, by the way, uh, who wants to know about the potential downstream costs of the loss or shrinkage of print collections. So as, as libraries shift more and more of the materials from print analog to, to digital, what are some of the downstream costs that we should be concerned about? I think we talked a little bit about the shift in the librarian's role from owning to kind of stewarding access. Uh, any other costs that we should keep in mind? Well, I think we've, I don't think we've seen a huge shift in print book collections as a result of this yeah. initiative. I think um, if you look comparatively at the amount of journal back files that have been deaccessioned mm -hmm. um, as a result of digitization, I, I, I'm not aware that a similar scale of transformation is taking place in, in book collections. And, you know, maybe that's for the best in the sense that um, to the discussion we had earlier about controlled digital lending, maybe everyone is going to want to save copies of those print books so that the digital versions, the digitized versions, can be lent out over the over the course of time. It's a it's a curious curious uh, curious dynamic. That's that's for sure. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a few more notes are coming in in the chat. Um, Lisa Hinchliff uh, thinks the focus is on transforming scholarly journal publishing to open access. Uh, Alan Bell speaks about Ontario as a jurisdiction where digital collections are built collaboratively for the 21st century. 
um, and gives us a link to scholarsportal.info. Thank you, Al. Um, I guess as the as the futurist today, I, I wanted to ask a question to ask you all to look ahead of about ten years um, and where this where this might go. Are are you thinking, for example? Might we see uh, more and more intermediary levels of tools that, like Google Scholar, for example, become uh, more and more important? Uh, might we see uh, non-U.S. sources really step up in terms of digitization? I'm thinking, for example, about the Chinese government or about the European Union, minus Britain. Um, or might we, as the climate crisis gets more and more terrifying, might we come up with something like a a digital library equivalent of the Svalbard Seed Library as a way of storing humanity's scholarship uh, against the coming darkness. I mean, where, where do you think this might, might be headed in the next 10 years? Well, my view is um, the users will determine what libraries do. And they're coming mm -hmm. equipped as digital scholars they don't know anything about using this print book. <laughs> um, I, I just think users will determine a lot of what libraries do because they have to. They do. And so it's users we should be paying careful attention to. I think so. Thank you, thank you. And Roger, do you want to take a run at that? Oh, I think that's I think that's extremely well said by Deanna. I think that um, that that users and user behavior behaviors, the kinds of um, consumer behaviors that we see in other parts of the digital world, um, the research practices, the instructional practices, the ways that um, you know, the ways that the university ecosystem is changing as a result of student demographics, changing instructional modalities, all of that mm -hmm. is going to drive enormous shifts in um, in in libraries and, and library collections and, and digital access. So I, I just couldn't agree, couldn't agree more with Deanna about that. Well, thank you. That's a very lowercase d democratic way of thinking about it, which I, which I approve. Uh, unfortunately, and somehow we are out of time. Oh. We, we have shot past the top of the hour again in your very capable hands. Uh, what's the what's the best way for people to keep up with the two of you? Should they go to the Ethica SNR website, or um, Roger? Should we just stalk you more on scholarly fiction? <laughs> Stop. Twitter, email. I, I'm happy to happy to yeah. hear from people or engage with people yeah. any way they want. Very good. Roger is connected to everything. So nah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be fine. Um, keeping up with me is probably best done by email. Very good. Very good. Well, um, the one thing I want to say before we go is to thank you both. This is an important and fruitful and by the way, delightful to read book. Thank you both for your powerful contribution. And thank you both for spending an hour talking with us about it. Thank you thank so you. much for having us. We really appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. Both thank of you, you take care and be safe on the East Coast. But um, don't go away, friends. We have uh, uh, just a couple of notes about where we're headed next. So if thank you, by the way, for all of your comments and questions. This was a very, very instructive time. Uh, we have sessions coming up on enrollment, disability, eco-media literacy, the climate crisis, research universities, and more on libraries. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these questions, everything from deaccessioning to controlled digital lending to what happens to the Internet Archive, Try out my blog, brianalexander.org, or go to the hashtag FTTE on Twitter, and we'd like to keep the conversation going. If you'd like to go back into our previous sessions, some of which have touched on everything from libraries to scanning to copyright, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. In the meantime, as the fall semester here in the Northern Hemisphere gets colder and darker, it's wonderful to spend so much time with all of you, with all of your illuminations. Please keep up the great work. Above all, stay safe, and we'll talk to you next time online. Bye-bye.